Got it. We all right. Ready. Excellent. Welcome everyone to our Women Breaking the Mold in the Rocky Mountains Goldie Cameron program. I'm Cheryl Kippen, Cultural History Program Coordinator with Boulder County Parks and Open Space. And our presenter this evening is Darby Logan of the Nederland Mining Museum, who is our Nederland Mining Museum Coordinator. And we will just have Darby take it away and teach us all about um, Goldie Cameron tonight. All right, hello everyone. I'm gonna share my screen and get the presentation going. All right, and... All right, can everyone see? Okay, great. Yes. Everyone... Thanks, Dad. Can anyone <laughs> not hear me? Can everyone hear me okay? All right, awesome. So. And hang on a moment, Darby. I'm going to mute everyone, so you may need to unmute yourself. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'm talking now. So this evening, um, once again, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Darby Logan, the Netherland Mining Museum Coordinator. Um, this is kind of my last hurrah as a seasonal employee with Parks and Open Space. So very excited. And thank you all for coming. So. Um, we'll get started. Um, some of you already know some about Goldie Cameron um, or Goldie Griffith with her maiden name. Um, some may not know anything at all, so we'll kind of jump into it. Um, she, Goldie is most well known for being a performer in the Buffalo Bill Wild West show, um, but uh, she is a fantastic woman and has a huge, amazing story behind her. So we'll get started. And... There. All right, so on the left here, we have a picture of Goldie when she was young. She was born September 30th, 1893 in Kimundi, Illinois. Um, her parents were performers. Her mother is Allie and her father is John. Um, her mother was most well known for um, her stage names, Madame Russell and her trained dogs, and then also Miss Klein and her dancing dog. Um, so if the names are not telling, um, her mother performed with dogs in shows and then her father John um, had a traveling medicine show um, and in some interviews later in her life um, Goldie remembered very fondly um, her father would you know take these bottles of medicine and cure-alls and all these things and they would basically one of the things that they sold was um, basically a, a bottle of peppermint oil mixed with some other stuff and they sold it for a dollar as this kind of cure all for everything and people went crazy over it. And she just kind of chuckled over that, but it was just peppermint oil really, um, but they sold it like it was gold. Um, so Goldie, because her parents were performers, um, she grew up with them and they were on the road all the time. So um, she never went to school. Her mother, Allie, um, taught her how to read and write. Um, and she started performing in shows when she was six years old. Um, she would just kind of find roles wherever she could in those shows. Um, sometimes she would play boys, which was very common of the day. Uh, and they, in the shows that they were in, traveled across Illinois and Missouri. Um, they actually ended up in California in San Francisco at one point, and they left the day before the 1906 earthquake. Um, so Goldie's father, John, died when Goldie was 15. Um, and after his death, the two women, Allie and Goldie, kind of struggled to, to make a living. Um, you know, Ab Allie was still performing um, and Goldie kind of followed in her shoes. So um, when she was 16, she joined a um, traveling show and with the permission of her mother, went off with it. Um, and Allie kind of followed along, tried to track where they were in the news and didn't find anything. Um, and she actually ended up calling the police and telling them that her daughter was missing, um, filing a missing persons report. And uh, Goldie was not missing. She just hadn't made the papers. Um, so then in 1910, she joins Blanche Whitney's Lady Athletes show um, and performs as a female wrestler, uh, among other things. Um, this picture right on the left here is a promotional photo of Goldie during her time with the Blanche Whitney show. Um, and she was a fierce, fierce lady. She would wrestle women, she would wrestle men that were her similar size. And um, those women were absolutely a hit. Um, it is during 
her time with the Blanche Whitney show that she met Charlie and Lucy Mulhall, which um, they were a family of kind of rodeo Wild West show tours. And uh, Charlie actually introduced her to riding uh, horses and kind of getting into the Wild West side of performing. Um, so then in 1912, she signs a contract with the 101 Ranch Show as a trick rider. And during all of these shows, uh, she continued to still support her mom. And she would send um, part or all of her paycheck home to her every week when she got paid. Um, and then in 1913, Goldie joined Buffalo Bill's show, um, which is probably the most well-known thing um, that she was a part of and also uh, what she is most well-known for. Um, so Buffalo Bill's Wild West show started in 1872. Um, she, Goldie joined in 1913 and was a part of um, the Buffalo Bill, specifically his Wild West show until it broke up um, due to bankruptcy later in 1913. Um, Goldie and Buffalo Bill formed a very close relationship and um, Goldie was actually with Buffalo Bill when he took his you know, famous ride up to the top of Lookout Mountain and decided that that's where he was gonna be buried. Um, so she remembers that very fondly and she, she referred to Buffalo Bill as the best boss she'd ever had. Um, so during her time with Buffalo Bill, she, um, was sort of set up to get married to um, Harry Sterling, whose real name was Hiram Sterling, but his stage name was Harry Walters, Harry Sterling, lots of different things. Um, but so Harry and Goldie got married um, in front of 8,000 people in Madison Square Gardens on, let me find my date, May 9th, 1913. Um, and they were in Buffalo Bill's show together. Um, and if it says anything to how tough Goldie was and how dedicated she was to performing um, the night before their wedding, um, they were doing a show and Goldie was, I believe, thrown from her horse. Um, she went unconscious and broke her leg. She woke up in the morning um, in the hospital and Harry was there basically saying, get it together, we're getting married today. Um, and at their wedding, Buffalo Bill gave Goldie away, um, if that says anything about just how close they were. Um, but she got to per perform in that show with all of the famous names, um, but specifically famous women we have. Annie Oakley um, is probably one of the more well-known ones. Um, so we've got Goldie and Harry at their wedding um, on the left. And then Goldie and Harry are actually the ones sitting in this stagecoach. Can you see my mouse or no? Cheryl? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. So they're, they're the ones sitting in this stagecoach here. Um, and yeah, so they were married in the show and then continued to perform on together. So just a little bit of background. This is Harry or Hiram Sterling. Um, this is him in 1915 at Cheyenne Frontier Days. So Harry was born in 1885. Um, and came from a bit of, we'll say a checkered past. Um, he was essentially for most of his time up until the 1920s was on the run um, from a murder charge. So uh, at one point, Harry was in a bar in Texas and he had his dog with him and the owner of the bar did not like Harry nor did he like his dog. Um, and the two men's dogs started fighting. The owner of the bar picked up a pitchfork and tried to stab Harry's dog. Um, Harry wrestled it out of his hands and then the owner of the bar went to get a gun. Um, Harry was a quicker shot and shot and killed the man and then went on the run. Um, so came from a little bit of a checkered past um, and Partially due to that, um, Allie, Goldie's mother, was never ever a fan of Harry. Um, and that kind of comes into play a little bit later in, in their relationship. Um, so in 1913, pretty soon after their wedding, um, Goldie gets pregnant and um, she takes a break from 
the shows during the off season while she's kind of later in her pregnancy and goes to live with her mother again in Chicago. Um, and Harry continues on to um, do shows and the shows that he's with actually travel to Texas and Oklahoma. So he's trying to lay low as to uh, stay away from public eyes and not get caught by the cops. Um, he does not do a great job of that. When he's in Texas, he gets shot at. Um, a couple of his friends uh, threw him on a train to Chicago. And um, then he goes and finds Goldie. Um, she takes the bullet out of his hip and gives him a couple days to recuperate. At this point, she's living with her mother. Again, mom is not a big fan. Um, so she basically gets him out of the house as soon as possible and he goes on the road. Um, Goldie is still pregnant at this time and Harry basically rides off into the sunset and she doesn't hear from him for a while. Um, she gives birth to a little boy who she names Russell um, and he dies three days later. Um, she and her mother buried him and Harry missed pretty much the entire thing. Um, and during this time of grieving and, and sadness uh, is one of the first times that Goldie decides she might not ever want to see Harry again. Um, so in this time after she's lost her child, um, she gets a bunch of letters from her friends that are on the circuit. And um, one specifically is um, from Lucy Mulhall, who Goldie had met when she first started performing. Um, and Lucy Mulhall invites Goldie to perform in her show, um, Lucille Mulhall Girl, Rang Girl Rangers. Sorry. Um, and her and her mother, Goldie and her mother both decided, yes, this is exactly what you need to get your mind off of things. Go do it. So she goes and tours with Lucille Mulhall um, and her show. And for a while, because Lucy is still doing shows with her family, she has to leave. Um, and Goldie actually fills her spot in the shows and performs for in the place of Lucy. Um, so she does that for a while. And then in 1915, uh, Goldie and Charlie moved to Denver um, and they've made up, or Charlie, I'm sorry, Goldie and Harry <laughs> moved to Denver. They've made up um, for who knows how many times. Um, and Harry comes home one day and says, they're going to take me in. And so he is arrested, taken to jail for the murder charge. And um, at this time, Goldie is pregnant yet again, um, and she goes to visit him in jail, and essentially Harry says, look, it's really not going to look good for me if I'm married or if I have a pregnant wife. So, trigger warning, um, Harry asks um, Goldie to get an abortion and to also pretend not to be his wife. So she leaves that meeting as his girlfriend. Um, and then she goes and gets all of their affairs in order, um, sells their house, um, buys a train ticket to Houston where his trial is going to be. Um, she gets an illegal abortion and then is um, getting ready to leave. She gets a message from Harry asking her to bring $150 um, when she comes to Houston. And so she does, she borrows um, $100 from a friend and picks up a couple extra shifts where she's working. Um, and combined with the $25 that she had left, scrapes up $150. Um, and the night before she leaves, she gets a knock on her door um, and it's her mother. And Ali says, Harry is a bigamist. And this is my final reason why you should not be with him any longer. And she basically explains to Goldie that Harry has a separate family um, and another child, and he's been lying to her. Um, and she does not believe her mother, of course. Um, and then she also says that she's the one who turned him in. So um, Harry's mother-in-law is the one who called the cops and tipped them off that he was in Denver. Um, so she goes to Houston um, to be there for his trial and he is found guilty, but he's sentenced to five years um, 
with a suspended sentence, meaning he doesn't have to go to prison. He doesn't actually have to serve any time. Um, it would essentially be kind of like probation-ish. Um, and so Goldie is overjoyed and she and Harry walk out of the courtroom arm in arm. And when they get outside, Harry kind of leaves and walks over to a woman and a child. And Goldie realizes that her mother was right. Um, and then Charlie, nope, why do I keep doing that? <laughs> Harry um, asks for the $150 that Goldie scraped together and he gives it to his first wife, Nina, um, as an alimony payment um, because at that point they were divorced. Um, so, yes. And then as anyone would be, um, Goldie is infuriated. And let's see, I feel like my next slide is, no, okay. Oh, yeah, I, okay, well, I did this last time too. This is Goldie at the Lucy Mulhall show. And then, okay, see, I needed to restructure them, but I couldn't figure out how to. So anyway, this is Goldie with the Lucy Mulhall show in um, kind of the 1913, 1914, <coughs> excuse me. I'm gonna take a moment and get a drink real quick. Alrighty. So um, Harry disappears after his um, trial and sentencing and goes and joins another show. Um, and then again, in um, 1916, they have an interaction of sorts. Um, so Goldie is living in Denver at that point and um, Harry comes to Denver on business um, doing a show and she finds out that he is there and Goldie, as the fearless woman she is with all of her pent up rage, valid rage, um, she takes her gun and she shoots at Harry twice. Um, both shots miss, um, much to her disappointment, but um, then she is taken to, to jail and her trial is set for um, May, let's see. May 18th, 1916. Um, and Goldie always said that Harry had a knack for disappearing at the perfect time. Um, and he did just that. Um, when her trial date came, he just didn't show up. Um, so all of the, the charges against her were dismissed and she was free to go. So um, then she continues on in her performing ways. We'll go back here a little bit so everyone can see. Um, and she joins the Cells Float of Circus, and then she also performs in um, another kind of variation of a Buffalo Bill show as well, and, um, and that's in 1916 and 1917. Um, and in 1917, the Spanish flu um, comes and is in full swing. Um, and in 1918, um, Goldie actually gets sick with it. Um, and in her delirium, at some point when she had been taken to the hospital, she asked for Harry. Um, and they actually put a notice out in the paper because she had no idea where he was. He had no idea she was sick. They're still married at this point. So she just asks for someone. Um, and logically, that would be her husband. Um, so she wakes up on November 12th of 1918 um, to Harry sitting right beside her. And um, she's hearing all of this cheering and loud noises and she's confused. She doesn't really know how long she's been unconscious for. Um, and he tells her that the war is over. So World War I had just ended um, the day before and everybody is celebrating and she starts to feeling better. And thankfully she survives. Um, so after she recovers, um, her and Harry decide to join the Kit Carson show. And they went on and were traveling with that show performing in it and um, kind of contrary to what was normal, um, Kit Carson, the manager of the show was not, um, didn't pay his performers yet. Um, and they were all getting frustrated with that. You know, we understand that you don't have, you know, all the money that you need, but we still deserve to be paid at least half of what we've earned and the work that we've done because we've been here the whole time. And so Harry and some of the other performers 
um, go ask for their money nicely. That doesn't work. So then they go hold them up at gunpoint and then they get their money. Uh, they don't have all of it, but they get some of it. And uh, Harry and Goldie have enough money to get back to Denver. So um, they go back to Denver and in 1919, um, Goldie gets pregnant again and gives birth to her son, Russell, the second one. I'm not sure why she named both of her kids Russell, but the second Russell. Um, and she gives birth to him in September of 1919. Um, three weeks later, just as her luck with romance goes, um, she finds out that Harry was cheating on her with a woman named Lorena Tricky. Um, and Lorena actually came to Denver and her and Harry sort of walked out of the house that Harry and Goldie had arm in arm. And Harry said, don't worry, I'll be back for my son. Um, and at that point, she was done. Um, so then she is a single mom living in Denver, Colorado. And she's like, okay, how do I, how do I make this work? How do I pay my bills as well as, you know, how am I going to still make myself happy? Um, so she works in restaurants and cafes, um, on and off. And then the cowgirl bug um, is still sticking with her. So she continues on and decides, I can't do traveling shows right now because I have an infant, um, but I can do rodeos. So um, she is, she uh, performs as a trick rider and a bronc rider in rodeos until 1922. Um, she would take Russell with her to those shows, um, just do local rodeo shows, um, that kind of thing. And then once Russell gets old enough, um, Goldie joins the Bill Penny show. Um, so he's, Russell is around three or four at this time. Um, and as we know, Goldie started performing at age six. So she figured he's, he's old enough now. Um, so she joins this show and this is where she meets her second husband, um, Tim Doc, as I will refer to him from here on out, um, Cameron. And so in this picture, um, this is Goldie right here in the black, and then Doc is right here. Um, so the two of them kind of got close, and uh, she saw a lot of similarities between Doc and Harry in that they were both just very tough, very um, hard men, and um, that's kind of what she liked about him. So um, in 1924, um, the two of them get married kind of on a whim again, but this time he actually asks her, which is nice. Um, so they get married and they are living in Denver. Um, and right around 1925, they decide um, that they both need to be done doing Wild West shows. This is kind of at the time where they're both getting a little bit older. Um, they both suffered a definite like large amount of injuries at this point. Um, and so they decide they want to give that up and, and go pursue something else. Um, so kind of right in the nick of time, um, one night, uh, Christmas Eve of 1925, um, they get a knock at their door from Dr. Alice Moore, um, and she offered them work up at Tucker Ranch, which is, um, up near Netherland. Um, and it was basically running a boys camp as well as ranching cattle. So she meets them and says, are you interested in doing this? Do you have experience doing this? Great, come on, let's go. Um, so they move to Netherland Christmas day of 1925. Um, and they work on Tucker Ranch. Um, Goldie does tours of Glacier Lake and Kite Lake, I believe, Kite, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, they enjoy their time up there. I'm not sure, Cheryl and I were speaking about this earlier. I'm not sure if it's the Tucker Ranch that, um, that Boulder Parks and Open Space manages, um, but I also wouldn't imagine that there's two Tucker Ranches up in that area. So um, don't wanna incorrectly say things, but it's my speculation that they're the same. Um, so we've got a little bit, a, a couple of photos from Tucker Ranch um, 
And so Goldie and Doc move up there and they take Russell into town, into, into Netherland every day for school. Um, he really does not want to go to school. He doesn't enjoy it. Um, he, you know, wants to be just like his mom and be homeschooled and work on the ranch all day. And um, Goldie says no, because you have the ability to go to school, so you're going to. And um, so then after a little while, Goldie and Doc have to move away from Tucker Ranch and they move into proper Netherland. Um, and the reasoning for that is that they were um, making moonshine at Tucker Ranch during Prohibition. So not great of them, but um, no shame. And when they were in town, um, Goldie and Doc found work. Goldie was working at a couple different restaurants um, or she would still lead tours at Glacier Lake. And Doc actually found work as the town constable. Um, so he was enforcing, um, you know, everything that needed to be enforced, but nicely. He was very well liked um, in the town. And um, we've got a picture right over here on the left, nope, right, um, of Russell when he was young. And then on the left is Caribou Mine um, and uh, Netherland, as most people might know, um, was a super huge mining and milling town. Um, and Caribou is uh, the silver mine that was closest to Netherland that was the most producing. So um, living in Netherland, Russell had a lot of inspiration um, to, to look up to um, in terms of miners. And let's see. Um, this photo on the right is um, of Goldie and Doc when they were um, performing in the Bill Penny show. And then this photo is from 1923, so probably around that same time. Um, we've got another one. We can see Doc's little uh, constable badge here. Um, and one thing uh, that was an interesting fact about Goldie, but not necessarily when she got to later in life, she always had a dog. Um, so we've got her dog there. Um, so as they are living in Netherland, um, Goldie sort of finds out that, uh, yet again, her husband is cheating on her. Um, not to say that she didn't have her share of extramarital affairs. She was on and off involved um, with a man named Alfred Moore, um, who also worked up, up at Tucker Ranch. Um, but she claimed that nothing ever went um, romantically further between them. So in a way that justified it for her. But um, so Doc and Goldie decide to get divorced and um, Doc moves to Denver. He lets Goldie keep their house and she pays him $10 for it. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? And she lives up in Netherland with uh, her son, Russell. And then um, Doc and the woman that he was involved with break up after a little while and he moves back to Netherland. Um, he and Goldie were still on very good terms. Um, he was very much still a part of Russell's life. Um, and Doc actually got a job working in the mines um, in Netherland for a little while until he was in a mining accident, uh, which was pretty severe, sent him to the hospital. And then he moved to Denver with his sister. Um, and brother-in-law. And let's see, here we go. So then we kind of jump forward in history a little bit um, to Goldie, her time alone um, in Netherland. She lived up there with her son, Russell, until he enlisted in the Marines, um, the Merchant Marines. And uh, she took to doing what she knew how to do. Um, she worked in restaurants. And um, she, the first one that she worked in was the Trail of the Yukon. Um, she managed it beginning in 1945 with the Greenwald family. Um, and then she worked at the Trapdoor Grill. She never owned that one, but she managed it. And then in 1949, she opened up her own restaurant called Goldie's Corral Cafe. Um, she ran that for 10 years until it closed in 1959. Um, in it, she displayed her 1915 saddle that she won um, and 
essentially served as the bouncer everywhere she worked. Um, a quote from her was, I had a gun, I never needed to use it. Um, she would use her wrestling skills if she needed to, um, and then you know, handle the trouble how she, how she saw fit. Um, she also kind of became what I would call a town mother. Um, she took a lot of women under her wing, um, especially the young girls in town. She kind of empathized with them, um, you know, several runaways. She gave them employment, um, you know, all of that. And she was very loved and treasured by the town of Netherlands. Um, this picture over here on the left, this one is Goldie um, in her wedding dress from her wedding uh, to Harry, her first husband uh, from the Buffalo Bill sh show. And she got all dressed up in that to ride in a parade through Netherlands. Um, this one here in the middle, we've got her at um, one of her restaurants. And then over on the right, um, we've got her sitting and telling stories um, with the people in her bar. She um, worked and managed the bars, but she also uh, was very much an active part of um, the everyday, um, you know, coming and going. And yeah, she would just sit and tell stories and people loved to listen to her uh, and she never ran out of stories. So um, in 1974, she was um, crowned Colorado Queen of the Golden Years, um, which was an award kind of, um, I guess, now the word that I was gonna use has completely left my brain celebrating the Wild West and um, sort of that era. Um, and then she died on January 6th of 1976. Um, she is buried with her mother uh, in Green Mountain Cemetery. And on the right, we have her wedding dress. Um, this is when it was displayed at, um, by, I believe, um, History Colorado. Um, and that was, I believe, in 2015. So her story is still living on and being told. Um, and another way that it's living on, just a um, selfless, you know, I have no shame plugging this, is in the Netherlands Mining Museum. Um, so we have her bar from uh, one of her restaurants um, set up in the Netherlands Mining Museum. And um, we stand behind it every day. So Goldie is a little piece of our history there as well. Um, yeah, that is what I have for you. Thank you very much, Darby. Of course, thank and, you all so much. And I'm gonna bring everybody up here so that we can see everybody. And yeah, you wanna, share. yeah, unshare your screen then, yeah. So do any of you have any questions or any comments um, about about Goldie Cameron and her wild and sometimes not so wild times. So. <laughs> Where was she buried? Green Mountain Cemetery. I was gonna ask you where her restaurants were. Um. I know that one of them was on East First Street uh, in Ned. Um, I would have to double check on the locations of the other ones, um, but I believe that they're not there anymore. Um, and I believe her house is still there that she lived in. Cheryl, are you, do you know? I don't know if it is or not. Um, and I, I had heard that all her restaurants were like right next to each other, mm -hmm. but I'm not certain about that either, because at one time we had the name of a restaurant that, um, that we, you know, have not found that she owned or that existed. So, you know, you know, Goldie yeah. told good stories and I think other people told good stories about her. So, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I do know that one of, when she opened her restaurant, I believe one of the man or one of the restaurants she previously managed got new ownership and they were kind of competitors with each other um so but i'm not sure which one off the top of my head where is she 
buried in Green Mountain? Because I was just curious if you knew. Um, let me see if I. P81 is her plot number. I don't know where in the cemetery that is. Did you say P is in Peter? Yes. Okay. Thank you, John. And Darby <laughs> mentioned that um, Goldie liked to have um, dogs. And one mm -hmm. thing that I remember by my, it's been a little while since I've, I've read about Goldie is that um, one of her dogs, and it was actually a German Shepherd, like the one pictured, but maybe not the exact dog. Um, she did train um, and it served in World War II. So, so mm. kind of interesting, yes. you know, she was like her mom, talented, talented with animals, I believe, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any history on, on the son, on Russell? Um, he moved to California. Um, and he died in 1999. Um, and I have my sources on the next slide, but um, just for everyone's information, if you're interested in doing any further research, research or anything, um, the book that I used that I found was the most useful is The Last of the Wild West Cowgirls by Kay Turnbaugh. Um, and it is, uh, a autobiography um, and she did a lot of interviews um, and has a lot of resources from the Sterling family um, and just a fantastic book. So if you're wanting to know more information, I would absolutely steer you in, in that direction. What was the <laughs> author's name? Kay, K-A-Y Turnbaugh, T-U-R-N-B-A-U-G-H. And Darby, if you um, send your source list to me, I'll send it to everybody with the recording of this program so that Perfect. if people want to explore further, they certainly can. <laughs> Absolutely. And we did have a question as well, Darby, um, about whether um, Goldie ever wrote down any of her stories, but I know she liked to tell them, but you know. <laughs> I didn't find any anything of her directly writing it down. Um, she kept, she had scrapbooks and scrapbooks full of um, her stories, um, a lot of which was shared with the author of the book, um, but I don't have any record of her writing things down. She also did a couple of oral interviews, and then there's also a lot of newspaper interviews with her, um, so that would probably be the most direct way to get information from her, um, aside from the book. All right, any other questions or any other stories? I believe I heard today at the Agricultural Heritage Center that one of our volunteers there, Blair, I think he said his mom um, worked with Kay Turnbaugh, maybe mm. while she was writing the book, but I'm not quite certain. So, <laughs> so that was interesting, so. And if you all have ideas on other people, especially other ladies, since these have been, been pretty popular for us that we could do um, programs on, please do let us know because it's, so, you know, we don't always know about everybody that y'all know about, or if there's a program you would like to do, um, let us know and we can, we, can, we can get it all figured out. So it would be fun. Have you ever thought about doing one on Ernie Potasso? We could do one on Ernie probably. And, and actually Ernie and his brother, they were married. I don't know if we know very much about their, about their ladies, but maybe we need um, to see if we could. I actually, I moved up on Sugarloaf in 1972 and I knew Ernie and his wife's name was May. Mm -hmm. And uh, really nice people and just very open to everybody. Yeah, great. I think Suki, and I don't know her last name, might know a little bit about Ernie also. I've got a file that I 
but it's just bits and pieces on Ernie. And I'm gonna write your name down, Cheryl, so that I remember that one of these days we can talk about the Matassos, huh? Yeah, they were just really very, my, my favorite memory, I had come from the Chicago area and then we moved up there and we lived just on the other side of Sugarloaf. And the first time I saw Ernie drive his cattle down Sugarloaf up to Magnolia, I was in seventh heaven. I thought I was in cowboy country. <laughs> So it, that was really fun for me. Any other questions or anything? All right. Well, it sounds like not. So <laughs> will everyone take care? And we know that Thanksgiving will be here and the holidays before we know it. So. So, you know, have a wonderful one and, and hopefully we'll see you on another program here one of these days and one of these times in person as well. So that would be great. And thank um, you, Darby. You did a great job. Thank you so much. All right, everyone take care and thank you so very much. I'm gonna bye stop bye. recording now. Bye-bye. <laughs>